What's happening, everybody? Welcome into a brand new episode of Crossed Up. We have Anthony Sanfilippo, and we also have Anthony Sanfilippo here. So we uh, are going with a three-man crew tonight running it. And uh, obviously, uh, listen, this is my fault. Uh, I take responsibility for this after bitching in our last podcast about having nothing to really talk about and just needing to start the regular season Lo and behold, now we have something to talk about. And it's not great uh, if you are a Phillies fan in the wake of the news that Reese Hoskins has a torn ACL and he's he's likely to miss the entirety of this upcoming season. And uh, it puts a a major dent into the Phillies' plans here. And I guess we might as well just jump right into it and talk about what this injury means. Can the Phillies navigate it? Can they withstand it? And uh, just based on some of our pregame chatter, I think we have a, a little bit of a differing opinion on this. So let me bring you guys in. How worried should we be about the 2023 Phillies? It was all positive vibes. It was all feel-good stuff. The starting infield was ready to go today, back from the WBC. Trey Turner was in the house. It's all good, and now it's not so good. So where are we at here, gentlemen? Uh, I'll go first. Um, I think the bigger concern right now is Ranger Suarez. Not going to be ready to start the season. I think that's a greater concern than losing Reese Hoskins for the year. And I say that as someone who has very many times in the past took a lot of abuse online last year defending Reese Hoskins as a pretty darn good you know, hitter. I, I'm not going to say overall player. Obviously, I, I know his deficiencies in the field. Um, but he has been amongst the top 10 first basemen in Major League Baseball statistically since he came into the league. And so I say that, and, and you know, it, you know, up front as a caveat, because when you look at that and you say, okay, he's a top 10 player, I can also spin it back the other way and say, even as a top 10 first baseman, he's a 2.5 ish war player, which is a good player. It's good. 2.5 a seasons. Good, but it's not a superstar. And so can you replace 2.5 war in your lineup with what you have in house? I believe they can. The only thing I can I get concerned about is the first base defense. Like you can't trot Derek Hall out there five games a week, six games a week. Like he's just he's just a DH, right? He's worse than Hoskins in a lot of ways. Believe me, if they felt he was a better defensive first baseman than Hoskins when he was up last year, he would have been playing in the field. So that's a concern. But as far as the the offensive numbers, I think you can make up most of it with what you have. And then if you really feel like you need to replace it at the deadline, there will be players available that could upgrade the position. Like we talked about last episode, Bob, center field was a disaster in the first half of the season last year, right? And then they stabilized it at the deadline. You could, And yet they still went to the World Series. So like those things can happen. You don't have to have every hole plugged right off the bat. So my initial take is, yeah, it's not great, but it's also not panic mode at this point i think you can you can get by for a little while and then see what happens i agree i mean i i'm not a uh staunch defender of reese hoskins by any stretch of the imagination um he is definitely a good bat there's no argument there you can't even argue that he's consistently like ops plus 120 130 which is you can't ever complain about that at first base you kind of want a little bit more if he's going to be that bad at first base so you know it's something that you can recreate in an aggregate way. Like you can just kind of stick someone over there. That's a good fielder naturally and get the at bats you need to get the power in the lineup you need from like a Derek Hall and maybe a Jake cave who's been hot in spring and you hope he, he can provide that. And as long as you mix, mix and match and just find someone that can play it, not, they don't have to play great. You're, you didn't have great. You're just trying to replace bad defense. You're all you're trying to replace here is a bat because you already had bad defense. So so listen, I hear that, and and it's kind of ironic that now that this has happened, I I've been the guy that's probably been as critical of Reese Hoskins as, as anybody, and and I think before we really dive into the baseball part of this and what does it mean for the Phillies, I think it's probably appropriate to stop and pause and acknowledge a few things here, which we've previously acknowledged on the show anytime that we've been critical of Reese Hoskins, which is one, he's a great guy, two, mm-hmm. he's extremely important in that clubhouse. And, and the second point is, is kind of like a way to sort of jump off into this conversation. And like, let's just put the production aside for a second. 
I think that, you know, for me personally, I think Kyle Schwarber is sort of the, the leader of this team. I think that they have a lot of veteran guys that certainly have leadership qualities. I don't think that we have to be too worried about the intangible loss of Reese Hoskins, but at the same time, like, I saw somebody call him like the heartbeat of this team earlier. I don't even <laughs> know. That, I don't think I even agree with that. Right. Like I, I don't I feel either. Like that's, that's hyperbole, but I do think that he's loved in that locker room. I, I do think that his absence on the field in some intangible way is going to be felt. Am, am I overvaluing this? Am I just feeling bad for a really good guy who in a contract year in a spring in which he came out, and, and looked pretty damn good. Like, do, do I just, is it that I just feel sorry for him and what has happened to him? Are we overvaluing the intangible factor that's involved here? You can never overvalue intangibles in baseball. I mean, you really can't. I mean, guys talk about it all the time. You know, it's a 162 game season. And so there are, the intangibles come into play. They really do. And that's stuff about, you know, being a good clubhouse guy, being a guy who's, really considered part of the the fabric right of the team because he's been here so long that stuff is important right but let's be honest their best player last year was Bryce Harper you would have if you would have said at the beginning of the year you're going to have to get through this season without Bryce Harper for 2 months and we would have all said no way in hell they no make shot. the playoffs Agreed. right they, they're not making the playoffs and they found a way to do it anyway that is because of intangibles, because guys stepped into a role, albeit for a short period of time, um, and, and filled the void and, and, and were able to be really good players. And that room was that clubhouse was was kept together by good leadership. So, yes, that intangible thing that you're talking about, Bob, it, it could have a, an, an impact for sure. But it's probably better that it happened now and not in the season when it probably would have had a greater impact on the clubhouse. Now you know we have a 162-game journey, and Reese is not going to be part of it from day one. So it's not going to be something that, oh, my God, it, it affects us in the moment as much. I think that if, if an injury like this has to happen to a player that you like in that clubhouse, you would want it to happen now. So, so let me ask you this. You, you both kind of started the show here by saying, listen, they can replace this in aggregate. And it's going to be some combination of Derek Hall and maybe Alec Bohm slides across the infield at points. And Edmundo Sosa, who's had a great spring, maybe he gets more playing time. And Jake Cave is involved. And so we can kind of work through all the parts and how they might actually approach this in further detail in a moment. But I guess, I guess my question is when I, when I look at this now, do you think that there's – well, I, I guess there's a lot of different components to break down here, but, like, do you think that there's any outside help that they try to call on before we get to the trade deadline? Is this something that they are really proactive about and they try to address in the next seven days before the start of the season? And you want to take that one? Not that soon. Um, it's something that's going to take – it's going to take time to find – because at first they were just looking for another outfielder and another pitcher probably. Now you know that there's another piece missing. So you know that you're going to need a bigger bat. Doesn't it can't just be another outfielder? It's probably still going to be an outfielder that you find that that comes in to help this. And as they move pieces elsewhere, they try to fix the first base problem internally because it turns out first base is a position that you can generally fix internally. It's been done since the advent of baseball. So you're trying to replace a good bat. So the thing that they're looking for is a good bat that happens to play the outfield now, because it used to just be a guy who could play center. Now it's a good bat that can also mix in and platoon and help that lineup out. So I think that one of the things that I've kind of heard a lot about here in the, in the last few hours recording this on Thursday night, uh, a couple hours after we found out what his fate was, it's that this idea of Alec Boom just coming over and playing some first base now. Um, I don't know where you guys are at on this. My initial thought is that I, I think that it's a little bit presumptuous to just say, hey, uh, this guy can play third base. He's gotten a little bit better defensively at third. He can handle first base. Can, is he going to play as well as Reese Hoskins? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a fairly low bar defensively. So do I think that he could, if they decided to slide him over and, and play him in some capacity at first, could he at least replicate that defense? Yeah, and is he probably going to be better? 
maybe but like my my concern is that there's like this domino effect or that there's this trickle down effect and maybe you guys can alleviate that concern for me because i look at a guy like alec bowman i say like leave him there like i don't want to see him potentially slide across the infield i I know he's not a good third baseman i i know that even how we applaud his his resurrection last season he was still average at best probably still below average but I just feel like here's a player who who seemingly is really coming into his own, hitting his stride. There's a lot of positive momentum behind his game right now. Like, should I be worried? Should fans be worried about the fact that, like, hey, you don't really want to jerk him around too much defensively. He's finally just getting his footing. Now here's this fairly significant change that we might have to make to his game. Does that matter? Does it mean anything? Let me, let me say this, Bob. Because I don't think they're, they're going to do that. I, I really I don't, don't. I don't either, I, but yeah, it I, seems I, to be like one of the, hey, this is how they could potentially address it. Yeah, so sure, like, sure. But I think it's going to be a hybrid, right? I So let's say that you, know, when you play six games a week, okay? Look, if this is the, if this is the breakdown, are you cool with it? Derek Hall does play two games a week at first base. Just two, okay? Alec Bohm plays two games a week at first base. JT Romuto plays two games a week at first base with Stubbs catching. Are you cool with that? Are they going to do that? Are they going to do that? Are they going to play JT Romuto at first base once or twice a week? Uh, I just feel like this team has been reluctant to, it's like, hey, JT needs a day off. JT's off today. Like, we haven't seen them do that. We haven't seen them DH. Okay. We have, they, you can we still... haven't seen them DH JT Real Muto to keep his bat in the lineup. Yeah. No, you can, but you can still give him that day off that he needs and be off, off, not be in the field either. He's getting older. You don't want to risk it with a catcher like that. As good as he is, like, you remember what happened with Dalton? Like, yeah. he, it, it happens quick. Like, if that's the one thing that sucks with catchers is the moment that they, that age comes. Even sneaking them to first, Joe Maurer, that didn't work. They, the Twins tried it for years. It didn't. It didn't help them. So you want to protect him at the plate. You do not want to put JT in the in the rotation there. And, and I'm not trying to push back on this idea that like the Philly, like the Phillies aren't screwed. Their season's not over. We know that they have a lot of of pieces in this lineup. They're still going to be a good offense. But I just think like I don't know. And, and you guys are you guys are dialed in. Like I mean, you guys are smart guys. But like my initial reaction in the moment was like. This is a guy that is a big time presence in this clubhouse. He's good for, as you said, like I think his career average is 125 OPS plus. I think he has an 846 career OPS when I looked earlier. Like 30 home run, 35 home run guy. Like I just don't think it's that simple to say, like, hey, let's get Umundo Sosa some more at bats. And like it's all going to be fine. Like I just, I, I think it's maybe the vibe thing. Like, and I, it, it's a, I almost feel stupid saying that, but like where we were three days ago, like, yeah, we were a little bit worried about Ranger Suarez. We were a little bit worried about the pitching depth and the rotation, but we came into this just thinking like, man, like I even said during the WBC final between the U S and Japan, I'm like the Phillies brand is like just red hot coming into this season. Everything feels good. And that's even knowing that they might be the third best team in the division. And I actually think that that's one of the points that needs to be talked about here. Like the Phillies aren't, pegged as a hundred win team they're not pegged as the runaway favorite so when you have an injury like this and you're considered by odds makers to be the third best team in the division going in like I, I don't know man like i just i have like a little bit of like pause when i think about what this could potentially mean for this team i i, I don't worry so much bob i mean and, and we're, you know i know that we're saving it for next our next episode for the season predictions right but I, if this Injury knocks them down a win, two wins. I think that's the most. It is that really what this is worth? Like, I mean, when we talk about wins above replacement, like, are we really saying, like, hey, the Phillies, you know, three days ago were going to be a 90-win team, and now they're they're an 88-win team because Why? of this injury? Is that really all that, that matters? Like, is that really the impact of this injury? I, I don't want to make it seem like I'm just saying that because that's what his, that's what his war is, right? I mean, I, I just think that really – Unless you are really losing a superstar caliber player, I don't think that you lose that much because you do have players that can fill in at least a portion of what this player was giving you before. Again, collectively, they're not going to hit 30 home runs, 35 home runs. Collectively, they're not going to have an eight, whatever whatever you said his OPS was, right? Oh, eight. 35 40. 40 whatever it was okay it's they're not going to have that so you're you're not going to get there 
but you're going to get close enough that if if there is a drop off in your win total, it's not more than one or two off of this injury alone. That's all I'm saying. I yes, I mean it's it. There is a little bit of of concern in the sense that man, it sucks that you have to, you know, you can't afford another injury now. Like, this is it. This is this is the big injury for the year, and it's happening now. But at the same time, if everything else remains true, then I think that you're you're really only losing a game or two at most off of your off of your season total. I mean, you have to ask yourself, would you take 770 OPS, 20, 25 homers from the replacements with likely slightly better defense with the combination sure. of them? Sure. Like, that's... I, I, I would. That's pretty now, close. So then I think that kind of transitions right into what I want to talk about. So Derek Hall becomes a very important player in this line. I mean, he's always been since the start of the spring. I know there were some people that felt that he was sort of a, a coin flip to make the team at different points uh, coming in. He certainly earned a roster spot prior to the Reese Hoskins injury, but now people are looking to him to you know, play a more important part, probably be at first base, at least as Anthony suggested earlier, a couple times a week. You know, one of the stats that, that's kind of been pointed to was that, hey, he hit a home run every 15 at-bats last season, and Reese Hoskins hit one home run every 19 at-bats. And when you look at pure power and his production, if that carries over, they'll, they'll be fine. You don't really miss a beat, especially against righties. I mean, I, I think one of the, the – I don't know. I don't want to say drawbacks, but one of the things I would lean on if I were saying, like, let's pump the brakes on Derek Hall a little bit was that – he wasn't overexposed last season as, mm. as good as he was right. Like there was this feeling that, wow, what a story this is, but can he sustain it? And to his credit, when he played, he was productive, but now you're, you, it's, it's not like an ancillary piece. It's not a luxury item anymore. It's kind of like a, yo, you have to be more than just a cute story. Now we really need you to hold it down and, and contribute. And you better contribute because if you don't, we're going to be in a lot of trouble. Like, are we confident in saying that that Derek Hall can either a quasi replicate what he did a year ago, or potentially build on it and be even a better hitter than what we saw in you know 100 and whatever it was 35 at bats a season ago? Well, you hope he is right, but at the same time, I don't necessarily think he needs to have the weight of the world on his shoulders because I do think that it's a situation where you can still kind of protect him a little bit. I don't think you need 500 at bats out of Derek Hall this season. I don't think he needs to play that much. I think you can get away with him, you know, 350 this year maybe is, is probably what you're looking at Well, out of Hall, and that's an okay thing, and I think that, you know, that doesn't overexpose him. Um, so I think that that's, a, that's an angle that you can, that you can go. And, and, again, you know, having the other players that are available to play more, I think, and plus, look, you need the power to come a little bit from the right side too. Right, I mean, Derek Hall is going to yeah. Derek Hall is going to replace some of Harper's missed power, but now without Hoskins, you need a little bit of right-handed power. So, to me, the more important player, and it isn't even somebody who's going to sub in, and it's somebody yeah. we've talked about a lot already. You know where I'm going with this? Back to this guy is Nick Castellanos. He's got to be a guy who gives you more power now. It's not just it's not just go up there and be a three, you know, two eighty hitter, Nick. You know, go up there and get those singles and doubles. Now you're going to have to drive the ball. You're going to be in the middle of that lineup. Um, so I think that that's more important. And the one other thing I wanted to throw, Bob, at you and, and Anthony as well, because this was originally my, originally my story on Crossing Broad today was going to be about the lineup that the Phillies used in today's game. It was the first time that everybody was back and everybody was there. And you had all the position players, and you had the lineup kind of like the way they wanted it to go. It was Turner, and then Schwarber, and then Real Muto, Hoskins, Castellanos, uh, and I think Stott hit six, Bohm seven. And then, and then the DH was not Derek Hall. It was Jake Cave. And so uh, the question that I was going to ask you guys is, did they view Jake Cave ahead of Derek Hall a little bit? And if so, that's a, that could be something that maybe, hey, here's a red flag, right? If you know, if Jake Cave is the guy that they kind of thought would be the first guy, and Dara Hall's kind of the bench guy, well, then yeah, then that might be a little bit of a a little bit of a red flag. That's so that's the one thing I just want to kind of throw in as a wrinkle and kind of get your thoughts on. He has one, or Derek Hall has one career hit against left-handed pitching. In the major league level, mm -hmm. that's a red flag. 
<laughs> he had 130 some plate appearances last year. They only let him get 12 against lefties. They don't. They don't believe in him. I don't think they do. And yeah, it's nice when you come up and like you're the you're the hot kid in the streets. The team was feeling good. At the, it was the right time that he came up last year. And don't get me wrong, I'm rooting for Derek Hall. I think I think he's got some good power against righties, but he hasn't shown consistency against lefties even in his minor league career. Um, and if you're going to play first base, you have to hit against both sides. You can't platoon first base uh, like as a starter in this league. So uh, I think that the Jake Cave being in the lineup means they already put Hall further down in their roster. Yeah. So the it, it, what's what's I don't want to say funny about this is that we're talking about Derek Hall and saying like the organization probably does not value him as much as the outsiders do as, as the fan base does, and so now everyone is turning their attention, turning their eyes to Derek Hall. And just nine hours before we recorded this podcast, there was some pretty interesting writing on the wall about where they potentially viewed him. I mean, Anthony, I, I totally agree with you. I thought that this is what we were going to be talking about in, in the in the show uh, prior to this injury. Kind of like, are we missing something on Derek Hall and Jake Cave here? And, and now, I mean, listen, I, Derek Hall is a beneficiary of this injury. And, and mm-hmm. – my other question is, and, and I know that you kind of wrote, uh, I think you wrote Cody Clemens as, as a potential beneficiary. Uh, I'll, I'll open that up. I mean, do you guys both feel that, that he is, is likely candidate to, to make this roster? Or does this open the door for Scott Kingery, which I've seen suggested? I still don't quite understand that. I would think that he would need to play on an everyday basis. I still also do not trust what I've seen from him this spring. So I'm out on that. I don't know. Uh, again, I, I'm coming into this blind. So you guys might be waving the pom-poms for Scott right now. No. I, I'm not. No, no, not at all. And I know Anthony Anthony doesn't like him a little bit. Um, I'm in. <laughs> I, I didn't like him in 2017. <laughs> so, so I know that. I know that he's not on board with that. No, I think Cody Clemens is interesting. Look, I, I, I think it was – you know, everybody talked about Soto being the, the headliner in that deal, and there's no doubt that he was. But why is Cody Clemens coming back in that trade? What does Dombrowski like about him that he wants to bring him in, put him on the 40 man? What did they show? He showed nothing at the major league level, right. Issue, right? He was terrible with the Tigers, right? But there was something about him that they liked. Um, and it's not his defense because he's terrible defensively. No matter where he plays, he can play first base, not very well. Second short, he's played second short, third left in the, in spring training, and every game that I saw when I was down there, I felt like he misplayed a ball or he made an error. He was not very good. Okay, so Cody Clemens is not here for positional versatility, even though he has positional versatility. He's here because they like his bat, and he's hit well in spring training. You know, to his credit, he's been another guy that's been a pretty good hitter. I do think that Hall gets the first crack, but if Derek Hall does not give them what they want. And I don't think it's a long rope. I think it's a short rope because of expectations being as high as they are. I think Cody Clemens then gets the second crack at that spot. He's another lefty bat. Yeah. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't don't see it. I mean, he's Roger's son. So that's, you know, where he gets a lot of his cred from, but like, I I think that you're looking at that trade now and you're like, wow, we should probably have Matt Beerling and Nick Maton and that would solve all of our problems. So let me ask you, because they don't have those guys. So like, wh- what is the ideal solution with what they currently have then? I, I, look, is there an ideal solution? I don't think that there is an ideal one. But the, Anthony's right. I mean, with Cody Clemens being left-handed, they are a lot of these candidates are all left-handed, right? So, so something's got to give. Um, I think what ends up happening is I think they start with – you know, Hall and and uh, Cave on the roster. I think Sosa is going to get more time, whether it's in the outfield or, uh, you know, in at third base and bone bumps over for a couple games. Um, you still got Josh Harrison who can play in the infield as well. I mean, he's another right-handed bat. So, you know, that bat could get in the lineup. They're not going to, but they're not adding power. You know, I know Sosa's hit some home runs in spring training, but they're not adding power. So I think it's more of a kind of let's see how how long we can get by with what we have. And then after that's over, if we really need to look at it and say, yeah, we need to get something, then they're going to have to trade for it. And I think that's the that's the ultimate and, you and, know, thing that's going to happen. 
this is one of the things I heard over and over, I guess read over and over and over again today on Twitter. And like people were even saying to me, like, hey, you know, you were pretty critical of, of Reese Hoskins last year. Now all of a sudden it's a, a devastating loss. I'm like, I, you know, I don't know if it's a devastating loss, but I do think it's going to make it harder for them to get to where they want to go. And it's it's not that if you took Reese Hoskins off this team in early November and had three, four months to plan for it, it would be a different result than the guy going down a week before the season starts. Like, I think that like, you know, to borrow the Kevin Kincaid, uh, you know, uh, adage, which is, you know, two things can be true. Like Reese Hoskins is a flawed player. He's not a perfect player. Is this going to, is, does this thin out the Phillies and does it put them one more injury away from, I think then like, if this isn't a catastrophic injury, we are one more big time injury away from this being a real problem. Like there's only so much depth. There's only so much that you can withstand. And like when you have the potential MVP of the league already out of the lineup for two or three months, coupled with the fact that a guy that hit 30 home runs also out of the lineup, like, I don't know, man, like I feel good about the Phillies this season, but like you're, you're testing me here a little bit. We'll take that one, Ant. Well, I stopped laughing at your brother peering over yeah, right, my shoulder yeah. there for a minute. Um, so I think at the grand, at the, the finest level here is this gives them a chance. Not that it's good right now. Right now, you just got to solve it for now, make it work. But now, trading for that player, you actually have many uh, options of what you can trade for. You can trade for a big bat at first. You can trade for a third baseman and move Alec Bohm to first. You can trade for that outfielder you need. Because previously you had this position, whether or not Hoskins was going to be your guy forever, he was locking it up this year, and you were limited at what you could acquire. Now they're going to be more active, and I think that's a good thing. I know it's bad that Hoskins is hurt, and he's a great guy, and it makes it harder in the in the interim. But in the interim, you always figure it out in the interim. People get hurt all the time. So, so, so let me ask you this, just real quick, and I think it's a good point to ask this question. I saw it implied by some tonight that, well, you know, hey, this is going to kill his value on the open market, and he's hitting free agency. The assumption was that though he is a flawed player, when you look at the numbers, he's still one of the more attractive offensive options in terms of free agency going into next winter. This is going to hurt him a little bit. Does this make it potentially more likely that he does return to Philadelphia on a on a short term deal, like a one year deal? Prove it, show that you're back, put up the 30, 35 again, and then go get your deal next season. Or do you think because it, though that makes sense to me, then I stop and think about it. I'm like, well, this might spur the action that you're talking about. Like you have to replace him, so let's not bank on his return at a reduced rate next season make the move in season, go try to win a championship now. And just, he's gone. That's it. That's the end of Reese Hoskins in Philadelphia. It sucks. It's a shame, but let's not wait and let's not hold out and let's not see what his market is. You don't have much time. You have, I mean, you got two teams in front of you in this division and you got, you got to make it like you have to make it work. So, I mean, yeah, for the open, it'd be, it'd be nice to bring him back because when he comes back, Harper's going to be in the outfield again. So right. then you have a DH like, I would say it's more likely that he's back next season only because I put the percentage prior to this injury at roughly zero. So, like, does it does it crack the door open on a reduced, yeah. like, hometown discount? Yeah. Do I still think he's coming back? I don't. Yeah, well, so here's I, – I think that, again, Bob, two things can be true here. Um, the first thing The first thing is, is there a better chance of him coming back next season now that there's this injury? Yes, there is a much better chance. I'd say a significantly better chance. And I agree with you that it was at zero prior to today. And I think now it's it's better. It's a significantly better. It's not better than 50-50, but I think it's significantly non-zero, okay? Um, but at the same time, there's a full season to be played. And who knows what develops over the course of the next six, seven months that will determine whether or not you would consider bringing him back on a one-year deal. And when you look, and I, you know, in the story I put out today on, on Crossing Broad, I examined some players that could contend, you know, possibly be, you know, available because they are pending free agents at the end of the season. And there's a lot of first basemen who are pending free agents at the end of the season. Now, some of them are on teams that are good, so they probably aren't available. Some of them are players that, even if they signed on a mediocre to bad team, um, they did sign just this offseason, so it's unlikely that those players will be moved early. Um, they could potentially be available in July, but th they certainly are not going to be moved now. You don't go out and sign guys to contracts uh, <laughs> and then trade them 
you know, before you play game one. Um, so I think that there's the, 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 the numbers are limited, but I do think that there are some, a couple of interesting names in there as players who could eventually come to be available to come here. It's just not going to be in April. It's just not going to be end of this month. It's, it's going to be something that you're going to look at at the earliest, the end of June, but probably not until closer to the deadline, you know, and it, it, you want me to throw one out that kind of sort of makes a little bit of sense because he had a very Reese Hoskins esque year last year, CJ Cron in Colorado, who's not paying, not being paid a lot of money, right-handed power first baseman, you know, kind of a medium average guy hit 29 home runs. He, was, he puts up Reese type numbers, right? Doesn't walk as much. That's the one difference, but um, like maybe a guy like that is, is who you look at. Or do you go even cheaper and go to Oakland? Because maybe you could get him sooner. Maybe you can go get Jesus Aguiar, right? Not that he's – guy's not anything exciting, he, but he is a veteran who's played in this in this league for a while. He could play some first base for you, although I do think he's more of a platoonish guy, right? And I don't, do you really want to platoon first base on this team? I don't think you can with as many DH-type players as you have. So, like, there's – but there are a couple. But not many now, and, and now I know a lot of people are talking about you know Luke Voigt is on that minor league deal with Milwaukee, but I don't want to. I have no yeah, interest. Yeah, th- that in Luke does Voigt. not excite me. Doesn't excite me a little bit. So I mean, you know, maybe somebody else is. It, there's a guy who's on, under contract who a team's willing to trade beyond this season. I don't know. I mean, that's a possibility. Dave Dombrowski and, and Sam Fuller are the only guys who would know that. But um, if you just look at that list of free agents, there's so many possibilities as you think about next season that if you if you trade for any one of them at some point this year that could or could not make it you know way into a decision as to whether or not you would consider bringing Reese Hoskins back next season all right so you had alluded to uh earlier the the one guy that that might really be able to kind of step it up and and help out with some of the production uh, not being an option at first base at all. And that's Nick Cassianos. And mm-hmm. I, I guess, you know, we've talked a lot about him this spring. And, you know, it's all speculation. There's really nothing of substance to say definitively about him. You hope that he's more comfortable or he's made some adjustments. And the track record is that you should kind of be somewhat optimistic that he can rebound from what he did a year ago. I guess – Here's a, a different question or a different a different thing I'll sort of throw out there. Do you think that this injury in a way could um, – I can't think of any better way to say it than, than this. Like, do you think this injury could light a fire under his, under his ass a little bit? Like, you know, I think that obviously there had to be some urgency after last season. I think he was probably a little bit embarrassed, certainly disappointed with his production – I'm sure he came to camp wanting to contribute this year, wanting to have the the rebound season as it was. But now in light of this, do you think he goes home tonight? Like, is he laying in bed in Clearwater tonight going like, man, they really need me to do it now. Like, does, does this change him at all? Like, does it change his outlook or, or because like, see, I'm a big believer of like, and I have to be because like I coach, and, and so you, you believe in like the psychological element, you believe in the human element to a degree. Like, I think there's a good hitter in there. I don't know what the fuck happened last year. I mean, you know, I saw, I've read the stories like he, he was, you know, he came to a new city and that was hard for him. Okay. But like, I don't know. Like, I believe that sometimes like life can impact what happens on the field. Mm-hmm. And I wonder if there's like this thing inside of him that says like i gotta go now like it's time so it's interesting because as you know bob you know because i put that story out last week uh, while i was down there about him um you know i think it was already expressed to him by the team that he needed to be more of the guy that he was before that he needed to be better that, that last year was unacceptable i mean you just it's just by the answers that he gave when we had that that nice chat with him uh for about 20 minutes after after a game and and he talked about his new approach and what his mindset was and all that stuff. You could hear it. You could hear him say, you know, they're going to have me in the middle of the order and I need to I need to produce. And so I think that was already in his head. The question, I think, goes a little bit further. 
And when you look at the situation now and, and knowing Hoskins isn't going to be there, does he now put added pressure on himself? Because we know athletes always put pressure on. Like it's right? real. Like we we just yeah. look at the oh like oh well, he hits he profiles well against this type of pitch. He hits sliders well. He can handle this velocity. He's that like there is a pressure is real. What mm-hmm. you do to yourself psychologically is real. Like it has an impact. Right. And so yeah. I think that this is yeah. I mean it's, it's an interesting point. And, and to, to up until today, I mean if you look at his spring, yeah, the batting average isn't high, but he has his approaches. His approach at the plate has been vastly improved. He's been getting on base. He leads the team in walks in spring training. Um, he does have a couple of home runs. You know, he does have a couple of other really hard hit balls. So, like, he hasn't been – it hasn't been a bad spring, despite the, the lower batting average. But at the same time, does this now make him get out of that – little zone i guess that he was in of of focusing on doing things a different way and get and fall back into some bad habits or does it focus him more and make him be that much better of a player so that's the question that we don't know the answer to and we won't know until he plays games that matter but i think that's where i think it gets a little bit more specific beyond your question and i don't know if you buy into that at all i mean yeah obviously there's a mental part to it all and I think the most important mental thing that Nick needs to take away from it is that he has time because previously I think he was on an even shorter leash. Now they have, if they, if they wanted to replace him, they're not going to replace him first. They have another issue that they have. So he has time to figure it out. So he shouldn't be putting all this added pressure on himself to have it by April. He has time to get into a groove and get going. Cause when he gets hot, he gets hot. So I think he needs to just, you know, take that and go with that rather than putting pressure on himself because he doesn't I have guess, to do I that. guess we know the answer to this question based on on how you just answered that but you know Anthony and I have both speculated that man if there is a player on this team that needs to get off to a fast start it's Nick Castellanos do you think it's uh, unfair to suggest that by April 30th we're going to kind of know what he is this season like is it possible that he gets off to a a 220 start with two homers in april and he looks like the exact same player and then all of a sudden because he knows he has a little bit more leash he he can figure it out and like finally that that track record takes over in june like do do you see that as a possibility here i see that for i do i really do i mean because there's not that pressure to be like just as good as all of those guys that are in that lineup that can can hit he can now focus on Nick. He can focus on finding what he used to have. And I know that I know the outside noise is going to be loud if he's not doing it. It's going to be it. very loud. And it's funny, as you said it, I just had this thought like Reese Hoskins, I think sometimes caught some unfair animosity from the fan base. Like, I, I, listen, I, I would bang the drum when he would make certain errors, when there were things that would transpire three weeks where he would have two hits. Like I'd say, come on, man but he was an easy guy to sort of gravitate towards when it came to being critical. Like it was easy to be critical of Reese Hoskins and that's where a lot of fans would go. Well, now he's not around to be the punching bag anymore. And he absorbed a lot of that. So now where's it going to go? Well, it's, it's, it's not going to go to Bryce Harper. It's not going to go to Kyle Schwarber. He's a God here. Trey Turner might be the MVP of the league. So where's it going to go? My guess is it's going to go to Nick. And I do wonder in light of what happened last year and the way things played out, like, is he going to be able to withstand that? So here's the, here's the question though. I mean, here's the thing though, Bob. And I think this is kind of where Anthony was going with this. Yes. I think you're right. That's the, the fan ire, the anger. If things aren't going well, especially if he's not hitting is going to, he is going to be the target of it. Fine. But I think if you, wipe out that noise from the fans and you look at it from the perspective of Dave Dombrowski and Sam fault, they don't really have an option right. at this point to replace him because they have to worry about other concerns with the roster. So Nick's going to be there regardless, you, you know? So I think that's why Anthony's saying he has more time because oh, yeah, I agree. He's, he's, he's comfortably in a position Without Harper for two months at least, if not longer, and without Hoskins for the year, you can't worry about pulling Nick Castellanos out for any for any reason. Like you have to worry about replacing the guys that aren't there, and he needs to be part of it. Hopefully, he he succeeds. 
Um, so I think that that's where Anthony was going with it. And I think that ultimately that, you know, we can have all that yelling and screaming all we want from the fans. The fact of the matter is, is he's going to be in place no matter what. So um, I think that that puts a nice little bell on the Reese Hoskins conversation, but it's funny. We started the show and you immediately said, I don't even think that this is the Phillies biggest problem right now. Which is... <laughs> it's right. not. It's I mean, Ranger Suarez is a bigger concern. He's got inflammation in his elbow now. I know that they gave the, originally they didn't send him for an MRI, but then they sent him for an MRI. And once, so, okay, okay, now that means when you send them for the test, that means that there's a little bit more concern. And the test didn't show a tear, right? So there, you know, there's nothing in there. And you hear uh, Rob Thompson was on WIP this morning, and he says, you know, we still expect Ranger to throw us between 170, 180 innings this year. Okay, fine. So you don't think he's out long term. But why is – he hasn't done anything but throw off flat ground, then he did long toss, then he did a couple bullpens, and the elbow has inflammation in it. Well, that's not, you know, you may not have a tear in there, but that's building towards something. So to me, that is a concern. I don't care how the manager wants to, wants to word it and slice it. That's a bigger concern for me than anything else, because if you lose one of those, if you lose Ranger Suarez or any other, you know, of their starting pitchers, and I'll give credit to Bailey Falter, really nice start today, right? Five innings, no, no runs, two hits, five strikeouts. But if you lose any of those guys, you right now do not have depth in the, in this organization for starting pitching. All the guys that you kind of thought were your depth are done. And now we're hearing Matt Strom is being stretched out to be a guy who can start the season because Suarez isn't going to be ready to start the year the first week, week or two, right? So we might be seeing a few Matt Strom starts. And I know he started in the past with the Padres. I get it. That's fine. Not much, and, but yeah. Yeah. And yeah. he's a veteran. And that's so you you don't feel like it's like you're you're throwing some rookie out there that's going to get lit up. But it's certainly not ideal. And where does where does it go from there? What if Suarez, you know, keeps having setback after setback? And then eventually they have to shut him down for a month or two. Then where are you? That's to me, that's a far greater concern because they don't I don't think they have the people who can replace his production like they do have people who can replace part of Reese Hoskins. Production. It's impossible to speculate what's going to come of Ranger Suarez this season. Like I have to take the Phillies at face value at this point and assume that he will be back. Maybe it takes two, three weeks before he's he's in. Um, let's just assume he comes back, I guess. I, I think we still feel pretty good. Like the, I guess there's two different ways to ask this. Like, can the Phillies withstand two a two or three week absence of Ranger Suarez and still make the postseason? Still get to where they want to go? Do we feel pretty good about it? If it's Matt Strom or Michael Plasmeyer or whoever they have to trot out there three or four times to hold this thing together, like, are we reasonably confident that that doesn't alter the the math of their season? It doesn't alter the course of their season. Or, or is this like there's so little margin for error coming in that the fact that Ranger Suarez might not make two or three starts at the beginning of this year, it could be a devastating impact. Like, how should we react to the fact that there will probably be an absence at the start of the season? Like, how, how big of a deal is this? I don't think it's – I mean, I think it's a, it's a worrisome thing for his injury future because a left elbow injury is never something to mess around with no matter what it is. But for the season – you built this bullpen for a reason. You can now make sure that whoever you throw, whether it's Strom or Billy Fultz or, or when Ranger gets back for just two, three innings, you got guys, you got horses that are going to have to pick up slack in the bullpen more so. And Ranger, here's the thing with Ranger too, is like even if he misses two to three weeks, I think it's smarter to just not rush him back to be that full-time starter right away. Like he proved his effectiveness in short-term roles in the, in the postseason. Keep him in the bullpen or have him do two, three inning starts until he's actually ready to go. That way you make sure he stays healthy and that you're still getting effectiveness out of him without injuring him. And in well, the I, event that oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no. I mean, I was just going to say, I mean, this is, this is Anthony's like, you know, <laughs> delight here because he, he believes in, you know, nobody really being a, a, a horse starting pitcher anymore, unless you're like a superstar stud, right? He believes more in just guys who could th multiple guys who could throw three innings, and and everything will be fantastic. And he thinks that that's the way it should be because that's how they used to do it in like the 1920s. So, so like I think that that's what you know. 
I mean, I know not everybody was like that, but their guys no. would start or and relieve, you know, and, and throw yes. multiple innings. Right. Yeah. Yes. That's what I that's what I kind of meant. Um, look, <laughs> yeah. Can you do that? And if you're if you're only going to get away with, you know, one, uh, you know, missing like, you know, one or two weeks or three, even three weeks. Yeah. OK, fine. But nobody else better get hurt. That's the thing. It's like you you are at your max, I think, at this point with injuries that are going to be of any significant length. And I think that like, you can't have it go any longer. If it does go longer. Uh, I think this kind of comes to more of like a philosophical question. We talked about the idea of potentially in time addressing the Reese Hoskins injury from, from the outside. Like maybe they're, they're certainly not going to do it right now, but as the season goes along, you get to the trade deadline, you start looking at options. If Ranger Suarez goes south here, has another setback, it becomes obvious that he's going to miss multiple months or even let's like go, you know, doomsday here. He's there's a big problem season long. The Phillies are so invested here, both financially and in just in terms of trying to meet these massive expectations. Is it is it fair to say that, that Dave Dombrowski is probably going to be aggressive in, in trying to find a replacement and not just like a stopgap, but a guy that you can actually slot in middle of the rotation three, four and feel pretty good about? Does it move up the timeline of a guy like Mick Abel? Like uh, Anthony, you and I, I know uh, have sent some text messages back and forth. I've seen a couple people uh, <laughs> that have some like prominence in Philly's coverage say like, maybe this opens the door for Mick Abel to that, start that has platforms. Yes. And like, it doesn't. <laughs> and no, it's just all. to be clear. It does not, but does it open the door for him come mid June, mid July? Like what are they going to do? Cause I don't think it does either. Like I, I just full disclosure, I'm trying to like kind of run point here as like a moderator, but I don't think it does. So what the hell are they going to do if this is a real problem? I, well, I think he goes out and gets an, another pitcher. I mean, they have to, right? I mean, right, they, has, they just I think he have has to. to. I wouldn't be surprised if they they add somebody, you know, this week coming up. Like, like you know, who look at some teams? Does anybody have an availability? Is anybody looking to move a, move a pitcher? If so, yeah, we're interested. If not, who's on a who's on a uh, a non roster invite with an opt out? you know, that we can get our hands on that we might feel could fill that need, you know, as a, as a guy. I mean, I think those they're going to, I think they're going to be scouring for that. I really do. I think that that's probably, I I honestly still believe that's priority. Number one, we saw, you know, the report last week, that the athletic put out, Matt Gelb put out that, you know, Oh, the Phillies are, are looking for center field depth. Well, were they really, I mean, yeah, they traded for Kusar from, from Tampa, who's a minor league, outfielder who's a center fielder so yes they were looking for depth right but they weren't looking for a guy for the major league roster i think that the guy that they're looking for a major league roster is is another guy who can start i honestly believe that's their first priority even ahead of replacing reese hoskins that's just my take on it i and i think regardless of 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 suarez's health he can he he could come back and you know in, in a week and be like oh i'm great i'll be ready to go I don't think it matters. I think that they're still going to go look for somebody else to bring in to be in that depth. And I don't think that Middleton's going to hold back in the amount of money he's willing to pay, whoever it might be. So I don't think it's just limited to some other third or fourth guy that's just another guy, not another Snow Syndergaard or something like that. I think you're talking like veteran on a bad team kind of money, maybe like not to put that out there, but someone, if he's healthy, Steven Strasburg. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Um, and, and, you, and you know, and just off of that point, Bob, that Anthony just said, you know, just from my conversation with him, that Middleton is concerned about the pitching. So. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, it's, so this team goes to the world series last year. They obviously, they fall short and I guess some people might look at it and say, well, they, they almost, they almost did it a year ago. They don't have to go for broke. The pressure to win shouldn't be so significant given that they, they had such a successful run a year ago. But the way I kind of looked at this all along, and I don't know if this is like the fan, the old fan in me kind of getting carried away, but I just look at this as such a critical year for this, this organization. And it's, it's a team that you have a lot of guys that are in their prime. You have a lot of, a lot of expectation. I think this fan base is trying to gauge, like, is this organization legit? Like they've, they've obviously done so much to try to, 
to really make themselves into a consistent winner. And I don't think that anybody should second guess that. Like you go out and do that Trey Turner deal off of what they accomplished a year ago. Like if things, if the Phillies don't have the season that people expect, I don't think it necessarily says that, that this team isn't trying to win or that they're, that they're, they're not all in. I think they are all in regardless of what transpires, but I just feel like there's such hype and the expectations are so great ahead of this thing that they're going to do everything they can to try to patch these holes as they go to ensure that they come somewhere near the hype. You know, like maybe it doesn't result in a World Series, but I just feel like that this is such a pivotal year for the way that the fans sort of buy into the organization in the long run. Like if they can if they can make good on it or come close to making good on it this year, I feel like it kind of like lets the entire city know that okay, they're back for good. You know, like if they fall off and they have this like flash in a pan, like once you, you made the World Series and then you fall back down, like I, I just feel like they need the buy-in from this fan base and like they have to deliver. And because of that, I think that there is more urgency from the ownership and from this front office to if things go wrong, if you have major injuries, to explore all possibilities to make sure that they don't derail you. Maybe I'm crazy. Maybe that's the fan in me hoping to see them do that. But I really think internally this this franchise is like, we've got to do it. We've got to figure it out at all costs. I really think that's where they're at right now. You're spot on. That's right. I mean, I don't think that the all the hype that was built up, even just from last year during the run, from a team that no one even in the city expected to do anything, and having that build and build and people being interested in, in the Phillies again and going out and getting Trey Turner. And the fact that everyone on this roster, yes, they're in their primes, but they're 30 and they're not in five years. Can you really say that this team is in good shape to win? So you have a short window. Like even if this year you don't win, you have to at least try. You can't just punt. That's the worst thing you can do right now is punting this year at any point, no matter how bad it goes. Yeah, I, I just I, don't want to think- see yeah, go, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Anthony. No, 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 no. I mean, I was, I was just going to agree as well. I think that I think you, you cannot, you can't just give up on the year. Like you have to, you have to go all in. And and look, I don't think that that means they're suddenly going to trade their top prospects, right? They're, those guys are not going to suddenly be available in a trade. Um, but at the same time, I do think that they have to get a little bit more, you know, aggressive if they feel they need to. Um, then maybe they would have because they thought that they had, you know, everything that they needed on this roster, you know, for the most part coming in. That's like we said on Monday, just start the season. Just get me to the start of the season. Nothing else can happen down there. That's any good. And <laughs> sure as hell has not been too good. I, I'm, I'm going to throw one more name at you, Bob, going back to the Hoskins thing that I just, just came across that I, that I didn't, none of us, I didn't write about, none of us talked about, but there's a name out there, veteran player who is on a uh, NRI with another team um, who could possibly become available this week if they decide if the team that he's with decides not to keep him on the major league roster. Any interest, either of you, in Yuli Gurriel? I'll let you go first. <laughs> no. Uh, <laughs> okay. Mr. Trashcan. I mean, no, like his numbers completely plummeted after that. Like he was probably the most beneficial player from that whole thing. Um, And he's very inconsistent just in general. So he's great defensively. (laughs) That's the one difference, but. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Bob. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I I think that you look at it, what do you have? I'm, I'm looking at it here. Eight home runs a, a year ago, 40 doubles is nice, but just the offensive punch isn't there. I mean, you're talking about sub 700 OPS. Like I just, I'm almost of the thought, like it, it, it's, this is a philosophical thing as well. And I think that's my word of the, the podcast philosophical, but you know, do you, do you go out and get a, a meaningful player or do you go out and get a plug the hole guy? And he's definitely a, a plug the hole guy who, might also be springing his own leaks. So, uh, you know, do you, if they brought him in, like, would, would I revolt? No. Would, it, would I be excited or expect it to really work out? Not really. I, I guess that's the way I would answer that. Yeah, the only, the only reason I – and I, I don't think I would go down that path either. The only reason I brought it up was I know Dusty Baker 
who I really, really like and respect as a manager, always have, even before he freaking won with Houston. But um, I, I, he was very, he pushed very hard for the Astros to bring Goriel back this year. He didn't get his way. They didn't, obviously, they didn't. He went and signed this uh, NRI with the Marlins. But, you know, if if Dusty felt like there was something there that he could bring value to that team as they defend a championship, then maybe that there is something that, you know, we're not considering or thinking. That was the only only reason I, I brought it up. Um, I probably stay away still, but I – What's you know, I can't. I can't get that base. out. Of, I can't get that out of my head. That, What's that, that the Philadelphia really fan base do with Yuli Gurriel? Like, how do they receive him? <laughs> Any differently than the Eagles will receive uh, Zeke Elliott if he signs here? <laughs> <laughs> Only Zeke can save us now. <laughs> oh man. Um. All right. I don't know if you guys have anything else, but I feel like at this point we're we're pretty good. Um. I don't know, Anthony. You have one last thing here. Of to course, hit. I have a one last thing. And you know what? I I originally was going to my original one last thing was going to be all about the the BS stuff that Elliot Shore Parks did with Mike Trout, but I spent uh, 10 minutes ranting on him on Crossing Broadcast earlier today. Did you? Okay. Oh, my, you please check it out because I killed him. Um, so, yes, and for all the listeners, if you missed it, today's episode of Crossing Broadcast, it's on the Crossing Broad YouTube channel. I, I can, can I actually him. just ask you a quick question? Because I know that uh, the yeah. Mike Trout's overrated thing. I'm sure you did not agree with that. I right? do, do not agree at all. Okay. No. Yeah. Let me uh, ask you this. And I think I know where you're going to you're going to fall on this one. Uh, an, an alternate criticism of Mike Trout is that um, the Angels are a bad organization and that he was out there long enough to realize that. And uh, certainly they've spent money and they've tried to add to that mix. And, you know, Shohei Otani is certainly a big part of that. Rendon has not worked out. Other big time free agent signings haven't worked out there. Um, any blame go to Mike Trout for still being and, and like, you know, inking that deal with the Angels? I mean, I, I know that the, the, the obvious response to this is when someone dangles that contract in front of you, you can't leave any doubt. You take no chances. You sign that contract. And if you want to get out later, you force your way out. Um, the guy hasn't won shit. Like, and, and like, whether or not that's his fault, it, it, it's not his fault, right? Like, you, you could look at it objectively and say, hey, it's not his fault. But, like, he hasn't won. He's been irrelevant in October. To be a true all-time great in a sport, you have to have moments late in a in a like I I'm a believer of that. I'm a big believer. Okay, of that. but you have to get there first, Bob. You do, and I'm the, not saying it's his fault that that he hasn't been. I can see like, Anthony's getting all worked up now, but like <laughs> when it's all said and done, like like let me put it to you this way: like here's where I'll agree with Elliot Shore Parks, which is rare. Um, if we play, if he plays another seven years and never gets there. I think we'll all say this is one of the best baseball players of all time, but like, I don't think it's entirely like unfair to feel like that there was something missing from his career. Like I just, you know, unless you love Dan Marino, like which... about Ken Griffey Jr. Ted Williams. Yeah, I, agree, Williams. I agree. Ted Williams. It, Ernie different... Banks. Also though, I will say though, like <laughs> different, different time, like 12 teams weren't making the postseason then either, you know, yeah. like Barry Bonds. I, I mean, like, I mean, you know, Bond seven time MVP never won. I mean, and so I mean that's the thing. I mean, look, and Otani is a great. But you think Shohei Otani is a great is a great player, right, Bob? Sure. Okay, so you have two of them on the same team. They're finishing twenty five games out of first place every year. Yeah. So when you have two generational talents, and you can't even finish above five hundred, that's more about. It's not about you guys. Oh, it's this about the, the organization. Whole, I agree. Yeah, it's I the totally Tungsten Armo Doyle thing, right? I mean, that's what it is. These guys are putting up great numbers and trying to help their team win and yet they lose all the, all the time. So yeah, that's why that was so my if, big If you're him, pushback. do you get to a point where you say um this is not working? And like at what point at what point can you can you be critical? I guess let me ask you this. Can you be critical of him at 2 3 years down the line? Because like on the flip side of this, like we get on guys like Kevin Durant who go and they they hunt the they hunt the dream teams, they hunt trophies. Some people think that's a cop out. Like, is, is, would it be wrong of Mike Trout, or should Mike Trout even take the initiative two years from now and say, like, this isn't working? I'm out of here. I'll, I'll let Anthony answer in just one second because I know he's going to want to say this, say something on this. Mike Trout's still 31. He's got time. That said, if I'm going to give any criticism, and I don't give much criticism to him because he's such a great player, 
and it's not just because he's from the Philadelphia area. I would say this about player if anybody else had the same same stats that he's had on any other team. The one criticism that I would offer is maybe he should have taken the Manny Machado route with that contract and left himself an an opportunity to go. The Alex Rodriguez opt out, you know, the the Manny Machado opt out. Take that path because that way if you really see that the Angels are not going to get there, you know, he's hanging he hung in because of Otani. Let's be honest. Okay, he hung in there because he knew he had another player of that caliber on his team. And so if you add just a couple more, all of a sudden you're you're in the conversation. But if it doesn't work out and Otani's leaving after this year and the Angels are for sale and you don't know what the new ownership's going to do, are they going to blow out all these kind con- then yeah, you need to get out. So that maybe maybe that's the one criticism that he he didn't leave himself that out. But other than that, I don't I don't think you can criticize it at all. And you can't criticize him for taking that money. I mean, that's just the, the first point there. The second point is he's continued to be great and he keeps them relevant and keeps eyeballs on the TV. The Angels, when they go to other stadiums, I know Shohei is the big draw now, but beforehand they'd sell out other stadiums because Mike Trout was right. there, no matter how bad they were. Okay. And if he, all it takes is one. If, of course, if they sell the team and things are just blowing up, get out. But, if they keep trying, all it takes is breaking through one time and no one will ever forget him, ever. So it, it, he becomes more memorable because he chose to stick with it. Think of like how LeBron grew haters the moment he left. Right. If LeBron was stuck with it, he would have won. He would. We know he would have won. He was that good. And like now, I mean, he's, he's going to great players are always going to have haters. That's just part of the situation. Like it's just ridiculous to like – like just shit on a guy like Mike Trout, who's literally been the best player for so long when this is a sport that like the best player doesn't win all the time. That's just the nature of the sport they're playing. If, if that was the case, then like why we, we still like people wear our hats backwards today because Ken Griffey Jr. was so cool. I do it too. Everyone does it, but guess what? He never won, but we remember right. him because of what he represented in a time that in a sport that doesn't always get that representation. So I think it's it's ridiculous. It's actually funny you say that because, like, listen, I mean, I'm not pushing back on the idea that Mike Trout's probably the best baseball player I've I've gotten to watch it at length. Um, you know, I mean, I was obviously I was pretty young, and as were you, uh, when when Ken Griffey Jr. was in his prime, and Barry Bonds, even. I mean, I guess I was in high school and when, when roided up Barry Bonds was doing his thing, and um, I, I guess you talk about Griffey and like you have swing man and like, there's a legacy there. Whose fault is it that Mike Trout doesn't quite have that same Rob Manfred, Rob Manfred. Yes. Okay. <laughs> oh, a hundred percent. They didn't market this game for years, for years. Baseball took its biggest dips in ratings in the mid 2010s. And Rob man, that was right when Rob Manfred came into charge. And look at, and in all honesty, look at the World Baseball Classic and the ratings that it had around the world. Yeah. And what did everybody talk about? And everyone wanted to talk about when's Otani going to face Trout? Otani versus Trout. That's all anybody talked about. Two Script players writers did a great job with that. Yeah, by the way. two players who play for one of the worst teams in baseball. Yeah. And all anybody wanted to talk about on the international stage was. Are we going to see Otani versus Trout? And we got to see it. So what does that tell you? That tells you that baseball fans know that they're the that they're the that they are the game and that the the league has it, it needed an international tournament to sell those personalities and to sell those players because it couldn't do it on its own. So I think Anthony's right on with with that. I think the commissioner has been one of the worst commissioners in the history of the, uh, in the history of the game. And I'm not, think a, not a lot of pushback for me on that. So, one. Did we ever, I, I, ever let you, did we ever let you get to your point or did I just hijack that? No, it, it, you did. You did fine. You did fine. You did, I got my point. I mean, believe me, like yeah. I said, people, if they want to listen to my 10 minute rant about Elliot, they can. Um, I did have one last thing though, which was <laughs> not that I was going, that was originally going to be my one last thing, but we, we snuck it. It's not going to conversation. What's another but, 10 minutes. Yeah, I know. Right. Well, this one won't be, I don't think this won't be 10 minutes. Did you see the the thing from Jesse Rogers at ESPN about Bryce Harper? <laughs> I mean, my lord. So I guess it's I, I don't know if what, what his thoughts were on this, but they were put, they were ranking the players right 
for this year, top 100, I guess it was, or whatever. And they had Bryce Harper come in at 58. Jesse Rogers writes it. And, you know, you know, he says he's coming in at number 58 because, of, you know, he's going to miss part of the season. Well, here's here's a this is a national writer who is covering baseball for a living for the, you know, worldwide leader in sports, as they call themselves. And the first thing that he says is he's going to miss more than half the season while recovering from Tommy John surgery. Obviously not paying attention to what the hell's been going on in this city uh, with with Bryce Harper over the past week, okay? Where the, the GM won't even put him on the 60-day DIL because there's a chance that he could come back that soon. All right, but that's that's just one little nitpicky thing. Here's where he went off the rails. This is his Bryce Harper season prediction. 230. Unbelievable. Harper returns with a bang in late July. Yeah. So number one, he's got it, got the timing wrong, but struggles to find his footing. He'll be a 230 hitter and hit 12 home runs in the second half. What the hell game is Jesse Rogers watching? And has he been watching for the what past is, yeah, like what is the deal here? Because like the, the, the point was to rank the players. And if you want to say, like, listen, he's working on an abbreviated s- season, then we have to drop him a little bit. No problem with that. But as you said, factually, the timeline has is, is been moved up here, and anyone paying attention sees that. So I think even conservatively right now, you probably have him on, like, a mid-June return, like, a, right. like very conservatively. Um, wh- like, where do he just, like, just pulls 230 out of his ass? Like, where are we getting 230 from? He's like, never hit that poor in his life. He never hit 230. <laughs> 12 home runs in two months like okay maybe but like also the he returns with a bang and then proceeds to hit 230 what's he do hit like 142 over a I know. six week stretch like what the hell how do you return with a bang and I then know. in the second half still only hit 230 what I, happened where i also i also find it hilarious that if you hit 230 with 12 home runs you become the 58th best player in baseball <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we just wanted to put his name out there and take a dig at Harper for free. That's what he wanted yeah, to do. It's bizarre. I mean, like, and you, you, you kind of would think like, I, I don't, I don't know him well enough, but like I've seen, you know, on Twitter, he doesn't strike me as like a take artist guy. So it was, it was a really, really strange commentary there. And to be honest with you, it was the only commentary I read in the entire list. I didn't look at the rest of the rankings. Right. I didn't compare Harper to who was 56, seven, 59. I didn't look. I just saw that and said, I'm good. Who gives a, I mean, I, I already used my F word for the show, so I won't, <laughs> I won't. Uh... Well, and I, and I know how much you like the ESPN writers on baseball. Oh, uh, kill me. They're, they're the worst. I mean, you're not, not, a, a, you're not a passing guy. I'm not a passing guy. I mean, I, I, he's a, he's a genuine, like nice human being. But God, he gets so fake excited about everything. Yeah. Like he had to go. He had to go on an apology tour for the league about the pitch clock when the strikeout ended. He's like, "This is the greatest thing ever." And I'm like, "Yes, Jeff." But like, you look like a clown doing all of this. Like, relax, my guy. <laughs> Who is the one guy that you can't stand? That's there yet. Oh, uh, uh, Sean Miller, Sam Miller, Sam the guy Miller. who wrote the book. Oh, I hated that book. <laughs> Uh, so anyway, so yeah, I mean, I, I always like to you know get the ESPN stuff in because I know Anthony, I know you'll you'll hate it and get some going a little bit. Yeah, get, yeah. Well, too, so good. We uh, we did a nice job here, guys. I, I think we we navigated the uh, Reese Hoskins tragedy uh, very well. Um, hopefully, there's no other earth shattering developments between now and next Monday when we uh, do some predictions, which. Might be a little bit different, uh, at least for me anyway, uh, than they were a few days ago. But we'll see. Uh, I have a couple days to digest. I will promise you that my prediction is only a slight change in win total and not a change in position in the division. So Anthony has just I want to play spoiler. Anthony has the Phillies winning 109 games. Uh, that includes uh, spring Mets, training wins. That's Mets. the truth of spring training wins. That's right. He has the Mets as the 58th best team in baseball. <laughs> They're going to hit 230 as They're a team. They're only going to hit 230 as a team. Uh, all right. Well, there you go. Thank you for tuning in. We will talk to you guys next week. Uh, check us out on YouTube, Spotify, Apple, Google, anywhere you get your podcast. Thanks for tuning in. Talk soon.